These rugged mountains are the front line in a fierce battle between the Pakistan army and the Taliban. A war largely hidden from the world. We're about to land in the district of Bajor, one of the many remote tribal regions near the Afghan border where the Taliban have a stronghold. I'm being given a tour of the army's training and operations here. This is training going on right here. And they're keen to show me their efforts to dislodge the militants. How are you doing? This captured position is just down the road from the army's main headquarters. And we cleared it on 27th of September uh, last year. These tunnels dug by the Taliban were used to shelter from the army's bombardment. It just shows how hard it's going to be uh, to get Al-Qaeda and Taliban out of these areas here in uh, Pakistan because of the guerrilla tactics that, that they're using. When you cleared this combat, how many people were killed? Uh, 15 of enemy and uh, uh, there were about 60 uh, miscreants here. The rest of them were able to escape from uh, the tunnel which I was talk talking about. Despite the presence of two army battalions, these soldiers still don't have total control of this area. What are those mortar rounds going off in the background? What's that for? The mortar rounds? Mm. Yeah, they they have, must, must have seen some targets. The Pakistani army has thrown everything it has at the Taliban forces here and caused massive destruction in the process. We, you know, started off with the early rounds, you know, followed by mortar rounds. And then if the need be, the aircraft also, you know, struck in all these areas. This whole area, once a bustling town, is now deserted. Everyone who lived here was ordered out by the army and it doesn't look like there's anything left for them to return to. The government took the action that we should clear, clear off this area. So you just decided to clear the whole place? Yeah. But some are now openly questioning whether the army's scorched earth policy is effective. The Pakistan army, they went into Bajor and said, uh, we'll clean this up in two weeks and we'll be out of there. That was in August of 2008. Um, it's now been uh, uh, nearly five months. Pakistani journalist and author Ahmad Rashid has been analysing developments in this region for more than 30 years. Now, what you have up in the north is basically conventional forces going up against guerrillas um, using conventional um, uh, high firepower like uh, uh, artillery and air bombardment. Um, there's very little follow-up on the ground. Now, a good counterinsurgency campaign should include, obviously, um, uh, 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 getting the leadership of the, of, of, of the Taliban, uh, holding the ground, and then, and, and, and then carrying out major development work. We, we are seeing no strategic plan in the north. Around one and a half thousand Pakistani soldiers have already been killed in this war. Three times the number of American soldiers who have died fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan. After the uh, war in Afghanistan in 2001, uh, it should be remembered the Taliban were never defeated. They were simply routed by the Americans. Um, uh, many thousands uh, escaped into Pakistan, including almost the entire Taliban leadership. Um, and uh, they were given sanctuary by the Pakistanis. It was in these villages in the north of the country where the Taliban found that sanctuary, a refuge tolerated by the former military dictator, General Musharraf. But when Musharraf was ousted in August 2008, Asif Ali Zadari, the widower of slain political leader Benazir Bhutto, became president of a new civilian government. 
and with him came a promise of a new direction. We believed that Musharraf was the president and he would sell this thing to the Western countries that he is fighting the militants. We always suspected that he was running with the hare and hunting with the hound. Faratullah Baba is the spokesperson for President Zadari. He says the new government is proud of its efforts to finally crack down on the Taliban. And if we do not check them now, they might well come down to Islamabad and to other towns of Pakistan and they might overrun the whole country. The Taliban are already firmly entrenched. Here in the north, people belong to the Pashtun tribe, an ethnic group that spans the border of both Pakistan and Afghanistan. The Taliban leadership is also Pashtun, and they have found it easy to spread their influence, taking over villages and towns. What we've seen in the last uh, two to three years has been the emergence of the Pakistani Taliban, which, which never existed before. Um, and, and this has been a result of the radicalization of the Pashtun tribes in the, in the border regions by Al-Qaeda and by the Afghan Taliban. As they once did in Afghanistan, the Taliban now brutally punish people here who don't comply with strict Sharia law. These men are being publicly whipped for crimes decided by the militants' own Islamic courts. This was filmed just a few weeks ago in the tribal region of the Swat Valley, where recent punishments have included beheadings. And this is one of the 200 girls' schools destroyed by the Taliban. They ordered them all to close and bombed those that refused. But it's not just the rural areas of Pakistan that are coming under the influence of the Taliban. The city of Peshawar is just two hours' drive from the capital Islamabad, and it too is now under siege. We're just on our way now to Peshawar and because of the security situation there, it's really important that I, I don't look like a Westerner. Um, so I have to wear all the local clothes because it's just not a good thing uh, to be a Westerner at the moment in Peshawar. In the past year, over 100 Pakistanis have been killed in suicide bombings and attacks here. It's not safe for me to film openly in the city, so local reporter Mushtaq Yusufzai is giving me a guided tour of Peshawar from the safety of his car. Taliban can nerve people. They are roaming everywhere in the city and they can nerve people from uh, inside the city. So they are able, they can do anything even now in Peshawar, especially when they see some Western and then they can nap because they think that they will pay them in dollars. Mushtaq tells me that the men in the car in front of us are members of the local Taliban. Yeah, actually they are militants. But how can you tell that, that those men in that car were militants? Yeah, being a journalist, I've been uh, meeting these people, I've been visiting the tribal areas, so I know them very well. You recognize them? Yeah, I can tell them, yeah. The Taliban are becoming so brazen, they've taken to giving press conferences, like this one held near Peshawar last November. In his first public appearance, the young Taliban commander Haki Mullah Masood warned President Zadari against continuing the army's campaign. Today, 
گٹ گٹ پر ہم قبضہ کر لیں گے کوشش کر لیں گے انشاءاللہ Masoor and his men are already tightening their grip around Peshawar. Now, now. 75% of materials for NATO operations in Afghanistan pass through this road, the main highway from Peshawar to Kabul. These containers uh, are, you know, supplying weapons and food items and other things for NATO forces in Afghanistan. In December, Masood's men cut this supply line in the most daring attack yet on the city. There were around 300 Taliban, they were armed with uh, heavy weapons and then they set on fire some of the containers which were loaded with uh, weapons and other equipment. Over a hundred trucks and 50 containers were destroyed, the Taliban escaping with some of NATO's weapons. <laughs> This video obtained by Dateline shows Masood proudly driving a stolen U.S. Army Hummer. Footage like this is not allowed to air on Pakistani television. The government has banned the broadcasting of what they call Taliban propaganda. The security situation is improving in the tribal regions due to the ongoing security operations. Instead, they're trying to give the impression the war is going well. The government is adamant. This time, Rahman Malik says that two of the seven militants arrested on Wednesday from the Khyber are high-value targets. One they make certain claims that uh, we captured this, uh, we captured so many Taliban, we killed 60 th militants, 40 militants, and uh, we secured the area. We plushed out Taliban from those, those areas, but in fact, it's not happened. Those areas are still in uh, Taliban control. So how can I report? What the government can't deny is that over half a million people from the tribal areas have been forced out of their homes due to the war. This refugee camp on the outskirts of Peshawar is home to over 14,000 people. <laughs> The conditions here are tough. The families were originally told they could go home after a few weeks, but they've now been stuck here for the past five months. <laughs> These Pashtun tribespeople had been living under the Taliban's harsh rule in Bajor. I found this man, 81-year-old Nada Khan, who told me what happened when his family dared to defy the Taliban. Despite the horrors of Taliban rule, not one person I met here supported the Pakistan army's current operations. They are angry at the military and accuse it of using excessive force. Twenty-two-year-old Faramush has heard the army destroyed his home back in Bajor. He tells me life was better under the Taliban. But aren't civilians getting killed in the army's campaign and also having their homes destroyed? And, and that's making a lot of people very angry with the government and, and with the army. 
that is true that uh, in such kind of this is a kind of gorilla warfare and in such kind of crossfire innocent people innocent uh, citizens also get killed this has happened in swat this has happened in bajawar this is the price one really has to pay when you are fighting the militants and the extremists and that price only seems to be getting higher a few days ago dateline received this exclusive footage that exposes the human cost of pakistan's war on terror these people are all from the village of Chaobar in the Swat Valley in Pakistan's north. On Sunday the 1st of February, the Pakistan army launched an attack on what they claimed were militants hiding in the village. But over 40 civilians are believed to have been killed and many more have been horribly injured. As the civilian toll mounts, the West is urging the new government to hold its nerve and top officials regularly come courting. Today, the NATO Secretary General is in town. Zadari's government is now facing a growing backlash over its handling of the war on terror. And our top story, the Shah. In another drone attack, at least 15 people, including three children, have been killed. Since last August, the US military has stepped up the use of unmanned drones to fire missiles at high value targets inside Pakistan. The nation is outraged at America's violation of their sovereignty and at the rising civilian death toll. 15 people killed, a second incident claiming the lives of children as well. What's going on? President Zadari has repeatedly asked Washington to stop the attacks, but even under the new Obama administration, the raids have continued. How does the government feel that the Americans are just ignoring their requests? Uh, that is true, that the Americans have not listened to this. They still continue the drone attacks. Only two days ago, there was a very uh, big drone attack in which a number of people were killed. This is really unfortunate. We want change! We want change! Opposition politician Imran Khan is capitalizing on the public's discontent. Imran Khan! Imran Khan! Imran Khan! This mass rally in the city of Faisalabad is just one of five that Khan is holding today. He's trying to mobilize support against what's happening in the north. This has, rather than uh, uh, winning the war against the terrorists, this has actually been the greatest gift for the terrorists of 9-11. 
Pakistan. Khan argues that the government's military campaign is actually creating sympathy for the Taliban and is calling for a new strategy. More and more people have gone on to the other side. There's no end to uh, uh, the recruits and to this war. In effect, what, what has happened by sending the army in? To get hold of 800 to 1400 or 1500 people, 1.5 million armed men in the tribal areas are being pushed towards Al-Qaeda or whoever was responsible for 9-11. So this is the most moronic policy. As the military campaign comes under fire, the Prime Minister has now raised in Parliament the possibility of talking to the Taliban. It's a big shift, but it may be necessary to ensure the government's political survival. The Pakistan government negotiating with the militants has not been liked by some other foreign countries which are also fighting the militants. But basically, this is a fight of the government of Pakistan, of the people of Pakistan. We will do it the way we think is right and proper. Nobody else really should be dictating to Pakistan how to fight the war against the militants. Whether force or negotiation will win the war on terror remains to be seen. But it's clear that Pakistan's problems will not be solved without also finding a solution to the conflict across the border. And with a US troop surge imminent that could double the size of American forces in Afghanistan, Imran Khan has this warning. All the surge will do is it's going to kill more people. More American troops will die. There will be more aerial bombing. They will further alienate the population. This would be a disaster for Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is a country of 160 million people. A, a destabilized Pakistan, a radicalized, destabilized Pakistan is in no one's interest.